The Saints are back. Wait, the Saints are rebooted. Saints Row 2022, let's call it, is finally here, and it features a rebooted universe where the Saints are a group of young scallywags living in the American Southwest. The title pulls back the reins a bit on the superhero antics of Saints Row 4 while staying more over the top than something like Grand Theft Auto. It all comes together in an enjoyable, albeit very buggy, 20 or so hour open world sandbox that is fun as hell alone, but can be played through entirely with a friend. Well, let's break it all down and see if it's worth purchase in the Xbox era review of Saints Row. You'll begin the game by creating your boss. Don't worry about being locked in here because once you're in the game proper, you can change your character on the fly however you want. The customization options here are incredible and only limited by the amount of in-game cash you have to buy more clothing. One of the biggest things that we'll get into later is the share system. But first, you begin with a flash forward scene. After witnessing that, you'll go back a few months to when your character started working for Marshall Industries to try and help make ends meet. You're stuck living in a crappy apartment with your four best friends. You've got Eli, a lovable nerd. Kevin, who's one hell of a cook and averse to wearing shirts. Nina, who's a great mechanic and an excellent driver. And Snickerdoodle, who's an adorable cat. Kev runs with the Idols, a neon-infused group of radicals who want to live in a postmodern society. And Nina runs with Los Panteros. Thanks to the roommate code, you all happily coexist as best friends trying to make their way to the top. After a series of over-the-top events, you end up deciding to start your own gang, named The Saints, of course. A big part of the game, though one I had only done about a third of by the time credits rolled, is the business venture system. A short while into the game, you'll unlock the Empire Table, and from there you'll run various businesses starting with a chop shop to earn you passive income and unlock a long-running quest chain. This ushers in a return of classic minigames to the franchise, slowly over time as you unlock each venture, and they're one of the main ways you'll unlock customization options for weapons and vehicles and more, alongside actual vehicles themselves. This is a pretty big game, though it isn't always signposted the best. I beat the main story in just over 20 hours playing the game, and I was not expecting it. I have continued to play through the business ventures, as some of them are really fun, though a few do feel like a bit of a drag to complete. Thankfully the game hasn't demanded I beat them all at any point yet, so on the whole I have really enjoyed them. As always, I try to keep these reviews as spoiler free as possible as far as the story goes, so I'll just say that I enjoyed it a lot more by the end than I did at the start. Every character is endlessly snarky, which is the norm, but until I got to know and experience things with them, it felt uh, hollow. Thankfully, the writing and voice acting are good enough to carry things, even when in the end, everyone is an unrepentant serial killer. The game does go for a very R-rated approach. You can spend the entire game walking around completely naked, with only a blur on your genitalia if you want, and there is a lot of cursing. It's a more lighthearted group of insane killers who are a fun family type of story in the end though. Any sense of things being dialed back in the recent titles is gone here, rating wise. It's never truly dark or even that grim, but it's definitely targeted at adults content wise. I played through the game on a Series X in one of the many graphical modes that I'll touch on later. The game runs at what felt like a steady-ish 60 frames per second most of the time while in the 1440p one. Despite this, I don't think the aim feels particularly good when using guns, and instead the game relies a lot on snap to target aim controls. Every push of the left trigger whenever an enemy is in your sights will yank the reticle over to them. Doing this while near their head and quickly letting off a burst of shots will have you mowing down most of the weaker enemies. It's not a terrible feeling aiming system, but it reminded me a lot of the 30 FPS feel of previous generations where the stick movement just isn't very smooth feeling. It's more of a herky-jerky dance as you try to get fine aim with any weapon. You do thankfully have options for both sensitivity and dead zone, which helped after I tweaked them both, but it still didn't feel great by any stretch. 
One area that did, though, was the driving once I got used to it. While your regular steering is fine, the main power move is holding A to initiate a slide. Once that system clicks, you'll be pulling off power slides without losing much, if any, forward momentum around even the tightest corners. A less appreciated part of the driving model, though, is how unbelievably fast every car pursuing you is. I imagine this was done because of their focus on their ramming system. When you're going fast enough and you hold either left or right, you can press X to ram your car and deal big damage to enemy vehicles. It's pretty fun, but you start seeing cars magically teleport in all around you while they're going full speed so that they can get close enough for you to have to check them. Aerial vehicles control well, and the missions featuring them were some of my favorites. Also, being able to call in vehicles once you've brought them to your garage or base was a great feature to have back as well, so let's get a bit more into that. Early on in the game, you'll unlock Jim Rob's garage and your home base, and you can bring any vehicle to either and store them for an unlimited amount of future use. Inside, you can also customize their looks and unlock special abilities or upgrade them. These abilities are tied to a challenge on a per-vehicle model basis and can be things like adding a tow winch to the back or unlimited nitro boost. The game features a lot of challenges and they are tied to the perk system. There are three levels of perks with two slots each and I had only unlocked two minor ones and one major by the time I beat the main story. It is kind of weird just how unnecessary feeling a lot of the game's progression is, but I am glad it's there and if I had known better, I would have focused on it more before completing things. Those perks cover a lot of different playstyles, and as you complete challenges, they will unlock in a linear fashion, and they complement the skill system well. Base customization itself isn't super deep, but it does add a little spice to things, though I beat the game within an hour of fully upgrading the base, which felt a little deflating, but that's on me. That skill system is tied to your boss's level, which goes up to 20. Each level can offer either a new skill or a permanent character upgrade to either your overall health or flow. Flow is an in-fight consumable that you gain through defeating enemies. As you gain pips of flow, you can use them to activate skills that are tied to a combo of your right bumper and the face buttons. The first one you unlock has you dropping a grenade in an enemy's pants and then tossing that enemy forward 15 feet or so and it is unbelievably powerful. I ended up using it for my entire playthrough, but I did find a lot of other skills to be quite useful and I would change them up to suit the situation as needed. All of this is done through your phone, which is brought up with a press of the view button. In there you have access to your perks, skills, contacts, music, appearance, and more. Contacts allow you to call in your friends to run around in the open world with you as you complete side content, in case you don't have an actual human co-op partner online looking to play with you. One of the biggest and best features in the game though are the character customization options. I'm pretty terrible at creating things, but thanks to the share system, you can search through characters that others have made. They released The Boss Factory, which was a standalone app well before launch, and it has thousands of user-created characters already. From celebrities to superheroes and even characters from past Saints games, the only limit is having enough in-game cash to pay for the outfits that they're wearing. After purchase, you can alter these characters however you want, and if a bottomless humanoid Winnie the Pooh with a truly horrifying looking face is for you, then your dreams are finally a reality. You can change up your look on the fly whenever you're not in a vehicle or at certain points of missions it gets locked off. I routinely would start a play session as John Wick, only to change to She-Hulk before deciding on Billie Eilish. It's a ton of fun and one of the best parts of the game. And this is a pretty big game with a lot to do in it. I imagine that you could probably mainline the story in 10 or 12 hours, but you'd be doing yourself a major disservice. The side content is routinely some of the best the game has to offer, and engaging with it to push the progression systems makes the entire experience a much more rewarding experience. I've been unable to try it pre-launch due to a surprising scarcity of review copies, but the co-op system I previewed before launch does sound fantastic on paper. You can play pretty much the entire game outside of, I believe, maybe the very beginning in co-op, and both the host and the person playing get full mission progression. So if you join with a friend in their game, then any mission you complete gets checked off on that account, and once you reach it in your game, you can choose to play it or skip it since you've already done it once and gotten the rewards for it. 
There are five main graphical settings in the game, each targeting a specific resolution. You can choose 1080p quality or performance, 1440p quality or performance, or 4K quality. Every quality mode looked terrible to me in motion. The bump in fidelity while staying still did seem quite large, especially as you decreased the resolution, which appeared to up the amount of objects, people, and detail. The issue is that not only does the game feel worse to play, but it becomes this smeary mess with way too much motion blur and image retention. After only a minute, I started getting a headache when I tried playing at the 4K 30 mode and went back to the best one suited for my gaming monitor, which was 1440p 60, which I think will end up being the main way most people play. And it ran well, though not perfectly. On the whole, I think the game looks decent. There is a ton of pop-in for either of the performance modes whenever you're flying, and vehicles tend to disappear while driving at high speed. Character models match the series' traditional look, but things are very clean and extremely colorful. Santo Aliso is a great looking map, with much appreciated variety in its landscapes. From the sprawling deserts to the skyscraper laden city areas, there is a lot to find as you explore and unlock fast travel and customization items for your base with the photo mode. One of the main issues in the pre-release build I played on, and I do not know if there will be a day one patch coming after I finished, is the amount of lighting pop-in. It happens a lot. Almost non-stop I found the game's lighting engine breaking for a split second, glitching through the environment and lighting up everything in front of me for a very short period of time before returning to normal. It was distracting and a constant reminder about the state that most games are launching in nowadays. And it was matched with multiple occasions where my game just completely broke. No matter what I did, the UI did not react to me pressing buttons. Another frequent issue that happened at least four or five times was an endless loading screen. None of the loads in the game seemed to take more than five seconds, so I knew whenever I had counted to 10 in my head that it was about time to turn off the game and redo the entire mission I had just completed from the very start. The bugginess is by far my biggest complaint outside of how aiming feels, and I hope it's either fixed at or not long before launch. Audio-wise, the game is solid for the most part, though at times the mix seemed off. It may have been further bugs, but sometimes the vehicle I was driving or piloting barely made a sound. People shooting their guns directly in front of me sounded off to the side, and characters talking fell out of sync with their mouths in cutscenes. None of these ruined anything, but it did detract a bit from the overall experience. The in-game music while driving covers a ton of genres and was pretty damned fantastic. I tended to stick to the Vaporwave channel, but the heavy metal one worked well during the more insane parts of my playthrough. Character-wise, you can also choose between various masculine and feminine voices, and I found voice 2 and voice 7 as my personal favorites. None of them were bad, but those two stood out with the excellent jobs that the actors did. Overall, it's an impressive amount of work to have the main character of the entire game voiced by so many different people, and being able to use any voice for any boss you create or download is awesome. In conclusion, Saints Row is a franchise I have really liked but never loved, at least before. This reboot is different though, and after 20 hours in just a few days, I keep coming back for more. Once the game is out in full, I'll gladly play it all again, and often in co-op. It's a big, over-the-top, extremely fun game, and if they can sort out the bugginess quickly, it's an easy one to recommend. As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you're going to like, comment, and subscribe, really, really helps the channel grow. And we'll see you here next time on Xbox Arrow.